Feast of the Nativity of Our Lady is taken from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 8. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Before he made anything from the beginning, I was set up from eternity, and of old, before the earth was made. The depths were not as yet, and I was already conceived. Neither had the fountains of waters as yet sprung out. The mountains with their huge bulk had not as yet been established. Before the hills I was brought forth. He had not yet made the earth, nor the rivers, nor the poles of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was present. When with a certain law and compass he enclosed the depths, when he established the sky above and poised the fountains of waters, when he compassed the sea with its bounds and set a law to the waters that they should not pass their limits, when he balanced the foundations of the earth, I was with him, forming all things, and was delighted every day, playing before him at all times, playing in the world, and my delights were to be with the children of men. Now therefore, ye children, hear me, Blessed are they that keep my ways. Hear instruction, and be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, and that watcheth daily at my gates, and waiteth at the posts of my door. He that shall find me shall find life, and shall have salvation from the Lord. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is taken from that according to St. Matthew, chapter 1. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren. And Judas begot Phares and Zara of Tamar, and Phares begot Ezron, and Ezron begot Aram, and Aram begot Amenadab. And Amedadah begot Naasun, and Naasun begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Salmon, of her that had been the wife of Urias, and Solomon begot Roboam, and Roboam begot Abia, and Abia begot Asa, and Asa begot Josephat, and Joseph begot Yoram, and Yoram begot Ozias, and Ozias begot Yoatam, and Yoatam begot Achaz, and Achaz begot Ezekias, and Ezekias begot Manasses, and Manasses begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josias, and Josias begot Yehonias, and his brethren in the transmigration of Babylon. And after the transmigration of Babylon, Jehonias begot Salatiel, and Salatiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliachim, and Eliachim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok. And Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliud, and Eliud begat Eleazar, and Eleazar, Eleazar begat Matan, and Matan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. <clears throat> Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was born Jesus. That he be the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle and the gospel today might seem a little bit peculiar. We don't read them all that often. We read the epistle, which is actually not an epistle. It's actually part of the Old Testament book of Proverbs. We read that when we have the Feast of Our Blessed Lady. And uh, this epistle, this gospel here, we, we read only rarely during the year. And you might say, well, I understand why. It's rather obscure. But you see, it's how the New Testament begins. Uh, the, first, the first book of the New Testament is the Gospel of St. Matthew. And that's the Gospel we read today. It begins chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. This is the very, very beginning of the New Testament part of the Bible. And uh, there's a lot there that... Um, we can learn there's a reason why the New Testament begins the way it does. <clears throat> a 
a list of names from Abraham, son of David, son of Abraham. It talks about our Lord Jesus Christ being a descendant of Abraham and of David. And this was a fulfillment of the prophecy. The prophecy that the Savior would be born of Abraham's offspring through David. And so the first part of the New Testament, the book of St. Matthew the Apostle, actually begins by telling us that it is giving us news of the fulfillment of the prophecy, the prophecy of the Christ. You know, our Lord is called by many names in the books of the Bible. He is called the promised one. He is called, he is called the Messiah. He is called the Redeemer. He is called the Savior. He is called the Son of God. And he himself called himself the Son of Man. God made man through Mary. Uh, he is referred to in the Gospels as the lawgiver and as the teacher. And our Lord has all of these titles. The word Christ, the, the name Christ means he is the anointed one. He was anointed by God for a special mission. And he, the Son of God, was sent into the world precisely to seek and to save what was lost. That's you, and that is me, that is I. We have this mission of God the Father, received by God the Son to come into the world and to rescue us. And so he is our Redeemer and our Savior. He is our Christ. The list of names here probably doesn't mean much to you. Uh, most of them are completely unknown to you. Some of you who've read the Old Testament would recognize a goodly number of them, though and uh, beginning with David and Abraham. And in true Jewish fashion, of course, this gives the lineage of the male side of a family. The men provide the legal lineage. <clears throat> the property belongs in that legal lineage of the man's side, so that the wife doesn't even necessarily inherit the property that her husband leaves when he dies would go to his male, the oldest male son. And even the daughter has a certain right to inherit before the wife does, unless she remarries within the family, as it were, within the, within the, um, the tribe, to keep the property within the tribe itself. The, the male side of the family gives us the list of names, and yet, you see, all of those names there, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through David, and down to Joseph himself. None of those actually are ancestors of our Lord in this sense. That you come to the end of that whole list, and then it suddenly shifts from the male to Joseph, who says, who is the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. And so suddenly, all of this list of names of men comes down to Joseph, and then it shifts the fact that he was the husband of Mary, and Mary is the mother of Jesus. So that lineage from David through Abraham actually comes through Mary herself. Joseph was only the foster father of our Lord, and all of those preceding him in this list, again, they would only be related to our Lord by law, in a sense, through Joseph. But it is our Blessed Lady herself, and her lineage from the King David and from Abraham, who gives our Lord that descendants. And so it is with the Jews. Legally, they are of the family of the male, and spiritually, you might say, they receive the fact that they are Jews from their mother. Their mother actually determines that fact. Their mother, Jewish, gives that, gives that Jewish character to her child. So you see, the, the focus of this entire paragraph here takes us ultimately to Mary and to Jesus, her divine son. 
And when we turn to the book of Proverbs, we see something else that, again, seems puzzling to people. Why, <clears throat> why are we reading from the Old Testament about wisdom, about divine wisdom, on a feast of Our Lady, and talking about Our Lady as though she is God's wisdom, as though this applied to her? People read this section from the book of Proverbs about the Blessed Mother, and they come away wondering, well, does this mean that Mary was somehow, did she pre-exist the world? Was she conceived before even God made the earth? Because it seems to be saying that. Before he had made the earth, I was there. I was brought forth. That's what it says here. And so when you read this, <clears throat> when you read this from the book of Proverbs, <clears throat> you realize, my goodness, what I'm reading here is about the creation. I turn back to the first chapter of the Old Testament. I turn from the first, from reading about the coming of Jesus into the world through Mary. Well, then I, I read this and I go back to the first book of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, and I'm reading about the creation and God doing the very things that you read about here in this book of Proverbs about God drawing the, the earth from the waters and establishing the mountains and so on and so forth and establishing the, the lights in the heavens and so on. And we read about the fact that wisdom, God's wisdom preceded all of these things and as though Mary herself existed before all these things. Is that what this tells us? Actually, no. What it does tell us is this, though. <clears throat> that when God makes anything, he has a reason for it. <laughs> and he fulfills that purpose. He designs what he creates to fulfill his purpose. <clears throat> Just like you and I, when we uh, decide we want to make something, um, that thing does not exist yet. It comes into our minds and we imagine it and we even design it in our minds. We plan it out, and then we put it down on paper, and we get the materials together, and we make the pieces, and we put them together, and lo and behold, <clears throat> our thought comes into reality, and there is the finished product of what we made. But it began in our mind. At first, it was only in our minds. We envisioned it. We actually designed it in our minds <clears throat> and the last thing that happened was it actually came into existence when we finished making it god gave us that power as human beings that reflects his own power but we make he creates he creates by the power of his will and so when god <clears throat> wants to create something in his intelligence he understands it he knows it he knows exactly what he wants to do and what being he wants to create. And so it was when he decided to create the human race. He wanted beings who, who could receive his love and appreciate his love and resend, respond to his love by loving him in return. He wanted this, a creature with whom he could have this mutual bond of love. And the angels, yes, he created them for the same reason. He gave them also knowledge and he gave them love. He gave them the ability to know and to love and ultimately to know and to love him. And we were part of that creation, the intelligent, thoughtful, loving creation that God made. He invested that in us too. <clears throat> now, of course, we are not God, and so we are not perfect in the sense that we, we are flawed in the sense that we can fail. We can fail. God alone cannot fail because he is infinite perfection. But when God created you and me and the angels, they being less than God and being therefore not, shall we say, not, not perfect in the sense that not infinite goodness, they were given a choice to make. They were given a choice to choose the love of God or to reject that. And the challenge was self-love. They were given the choice to make between the love that God had for them and the love that they should have for God, on the one hand, 
and their own existence, what they call the pride of life in the Bible. In the, in the Bible, it's called the pride of life. And this pride of life, unfortunately, enamored some of them, beginning with Lucifer, who became Satan. Now, this took so many, well, the entire human race away from God, and we come into the world now with that sin of nature, uh, enemies of God, having rejected his love, and we come in very proud and selfish and arrogant. There is probably no one in the world who is so demanding as a newborn baby, but it, it was incapable of love. And we have to learn to love, and many do not learn that. <clears throat> but God gives us the ability to learn to love and to learn to love him, finally. And those will be saved. Of all of those whom God created, who have learned to love him the most of all, and the most perfectly of all, the Blessed Mother, she is the one. She is the one who actually embodies exactly what God intended when he created us human beings. We may think of Mary as being very exceptional, extraordinary, and she is, in fact, exceptional and extraordinary. But God really wanted to create beings who would love him in this way, wholeheartedly, with a great love, with a great generosity, love him with all of her heart and mind and soul and strength, and be united with his love so perfectly. That's what God really wants. And that's what he actually wants of all of us. No, we can't love him as his mother loves him. That's a unique love that she has for him that no one else can have. <clears throat> but the love she has for him as her creator and now as her redeemer <clears throat> is the kind of love that God wants from every one of us. And that's why he created our race to be united with him in this love, this wonderful love forever. And uh, we see how far we've fallen from that. But that was the wisdom of God. That is what God started out intending in creating us. And the fact that there are some few who love him that much is worth everything. <clears throat> the fact that there are some few who love God wholeheartedly, <clears throat> that is to God worth everything else everything else, everything he had to suffer on the cross is worth it for those few who love him with so their whole heart and mind and soul and strength. This was what God intended in the first place. And here we have now a woman <clears throat> whom even the angels see as their queen, as I mentioned before, but we, our brothers and sisters who are now in heaven, <clears throat> our fellow human beings who are now in heaven, they see her not only as their queen, they see her as their mother. And they see a love in her that is even surpassing the love of the angels for God because she, in her lowliness, <clears throat> even exceeded the humility of the angels. She was able to exceed the humility of the angels. And with that humility she had, this perfect, absolute self-surrender to, to God, whom she loves so much, that God was able to raise her up and exalt her, even above the angels in heaven. It's amazingly true, but it is true. God exalted her above the angels in heaven. The angels are not jealous of this. They are amazed. They wonder at it. They thrill at it. They actually adore God more because of it. They see the power of God in this young woman who conceived him in her womb and was his mother on earth and is now their queen in heaven, they rejoice to see the power of God active in her, effective in her. They rejoice to see her embodying God's wisdom now in heaven and the, the triumph of God in her heart and her soul and the triumph of God's love there. All the saints in heaven, all the angels in heaven are inspired and as I say, thrilled by this, by the Blessed Mother and the pinnacle of his creation now glorified in heaven. This is why when the church speaks of Mary, she, the church regards her as though she is in the fulfillment of God's wisdom and his intention 
in creation, that she embodies that himself. She is the one for which he would have done it all just for her, if it were only for her. That's a wonderful thing. And it's a wonderful thing to think that by the grace of God, each and every one of us here, I pray, will someday see her in heaven, see this, this marvelous example, this triumph of God in Mary, and we will be able to look at her and we will see her. As the angels see her, we will see her as our queen, but we will also see her as our own mother too. Jesus, our Lord, the Son of God, took her for his mother when he became incarnate in her womb. Then he claimed her as his mother. But from the cross, as he was dying and breathing his last, he gave her to us as our mother. And what more beautiful sight could there be than to see her filled with the love of God, glorified with the glory of God, our own mother. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.